Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the Coriolis Rules by Free League Publishing. This actual play is performed by adults and contains adult themes. Strong language, powerful factions, and adventures across the third horizon await. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and etc., which may bear resemblance to entities living or dead, is strictly coincidental. My name is Michael Diamond, and for tonight's game, I will be your storyteller. Thank you for joining us again on another episode of the Old Ways Podcast. I am your storyteller, Michael Diamond. My pronouns are he, him, and we are back with our Children of the Periphery series for you, our wonderful listeners. And at the top of the show, as we always like to do, we like to thank you, the listener, and especially you, the Patreon supporter. If you've not had a chance to check out what we offer on Patreon, you can at patreon.com slash the old ways podcast. Jump over to YouTube and subscribe to our channel there to keep up with all of the visual updates and playlist additions. And now I'll turn to my cast and begin introductions to my right. This is Morgan and I play Captain Amara Kasra of the ship Sky Skimmer, formerly known as the Periphery. Our pronouns are she, her, and, you know, I'm really, really feeling good about this plan that we have. Good. That makes one of us. To Captain Kazra's right now. Hi, this is Ali, and I play Kainat Gala. Our pronouns are she, her, and we're probably going to do some very badly planned things centered around trying to get Fida into a place where maybe things will also go poorly. Seems about right. At the end of the table. Hi, this is John. I'll be playing Fighter, the chess mechanic. We both use he, him pronouns. And, um, you know, I have nothing to worry about. This is all going to go swimmingly. So, oh, my ink, my tattoos are moving, but that's neither here nor there. We just won't bring it up again. I'm sure it'll be perfectly fine. To fight is right. Hi, this is Rena. I play Tamaris Ganvari. Our pronouns are they, them. And I'm a bit worried about how many darkness points our storyteller may or may not have. Mm, a wonderful concern to have as a player. Last, but most certainly not least. Hello there, I am Rosie of Odd Duck Dice, playing Icarus. Our pronouns are she, her. And Icarus is the pilot of the Sky Skimmer, and she did some fancy flying and some math. And we're here now. And people probably know we're here now. It's a good summary of events, for sure. So the crew has landed on the planet. A uh, dusky and dingy planet. That planet is Amusa. And in this section, there is a very, very wide swath of the planet that is lacking in any sort of vegetation. And as that dust comes out of the soil here, or what's left of it, it does sort of bring you back to the desert area when you last saw the portal builder technology used. You wonder if there's a corollary, Fida. Maybe there's something in the technology that has to take something from the land itself, but if this major installation was built by them, then maybe there's something to that. The entrance while still yet unknown, is presumed to be just about a kilometer away. And as the crew has gathered their equipment and necessary items, I would like to give them the opportunity to notify you, the listener, and especially me, the storyteller, of anything they might be bringing with for this journey. I am bringing all of my normal equipment. An entirely unstealthy approach. I am bringing the exoloader. Really? Yeah, I um, I can always leave it outside. I love it. It might not be there when I get back, but I can leave it outside. I feel like it's going to be useful in certain applications. I'm also bringing my hyper rope. Okay. Oh, and my environment scanner for trying to find this goddamn entrance. Anybody else? What's the um, atmosphere like on the planet? Technically breathable, although filled with a lot of fine particulates, including dust and other formerly wayward vegetation. Think about this place like 
New Mexico. Arid, probably a bit rocky. There's a a cloudy nature to the atmosphere here, at least in this section of the planet. In our array of things that we have on the ship, do we have any, like, masks or anything for breathing? Something that's not a full suit? Oh, certainly. Yeah, you certainly have, like, strappable rebreather units that would probably keep you from having to breathe the air for, you know, an hour or two. You'd have a sustained supply. It'd have a, you know, a, sort of like a tether and a small tank that you could you could carry it on. Yeah, I'll grab a, a rebreather, and then I will also make sure and have my Vulcan pistol and my dagger with me. I have a, a pad, a tabla, and something to cover. Did you say it was kind of arid and dusty? I'll, I'll go see Kynat to see if I can borrow one of her lovely scarves. Because the last one I borrowed, I think, got ruined. Yeah. Yeah, you have your choice of, like, 11 colors in my closet. Do you want an orange one, Captain? No, I I want a brown one to match my coat. Okay. You prepare yourself. You wrap your head in a scarf and put the rebreather on, and you feel like it's, you know, back at mom and dad's place, and you're sick, and they're trying to keep you warm, and... Now you just want to sit on the couch and relax and watch the trid. Icarus, make any other special preparations as you go? No. This, Icarus has no idea what precisely she's going to be assisting with, but I think it should be made clear that she is planning on returning to the periphery because, well, she's, she's not planning on going through... Her family's on Kua. She's not planning on leaving the third horizon anytime soon. So she's not entirely sure what they're going to be doing, but she's figuring they'll either be dead really fast or she'll have a chance to come back. Seems reasonable. Okay. You set out from the periphery and you begin this walk through the space here, wind whipping around, dust and sand getting in any place it can. It covers some of the mask, any sort of scarf that you wear, and it begins to coat it as the dust storm rolls in. It does do exactly what Icarus was planning, which gives you an enormous amount of visual cover. It swallows the ship, and soon after, you all. So I'm going to ask for a survival roll to see how well you all do on your way in. I got lots of that. Good. I'm probably the only person who has lots of that. Now, Mike, I have to ask, is this the scenario of seeking threats? In which case my scanner might be useful. Yeah, I, I think I think you could make an argument for it, right? So th- that's sort of like the you know, the important thing here when we talk about skill adjudication is if you have equipment assets that you think you could use, that's a good time to make that sort of argument for them. Hey, we're looking for a thing. Help me stay on track. Oh, I have a compass. Even if I know what I'm looking for and I don't know where it is, at least my scanner will tell me where it isn't. Very true. Can I use my compass? Yeah, I don't see why you couldn't. I have no successes. I'm not surviving. Okay, we'll keep that. Uh, we'll keep a hold of that. So my dice pool is eight with my equipment, and I got five successes. Okay, we'll put a pin in that. I got two successes. I got one. One success. Okay. So, kind of along the way, you not only share your scarf with the captain. You keep the captain from falling into a hole, a rare large one that likely would have meant her end. You do so by clearly getting a critical on your survival role. You effectively, along with Fida, become sort of this arrow point for the team to stay on the trail. Between one and two successes, you make your way through this dust storm, but you're by no means in charge of really your own footsteps. The wind is buffeting you left and right. For those of you who are sort of, we would just say a little lighter, it 
almost bowls you over. It almost picks you up off the ground. It's a violent storm that comes in. That said, probably after about 20 minutes or so, you make the kilometer distance and Fida, your scanner tells you that you're effectively right on top of whatever it's supposed to be. And that is when I'm going to have you make me a strength roll. Everybody or just Fida? Just Fida. None of, none, none of you else are, are marked as he is. It's my favorite, being marked. So just strength, yeah? Yeah, strength. Um, What's the linked attribute there? Uh, strength is the attribute. Force would be the kind of bend bars, lift doors. Yeah, we're not there yet. Just strength. Just strength. Gotcha. All right. One success. Okay. You hold it together as the scanner begins to wobble a little bit. And it's not wobbling from the wind. It's not wobbling from any sort of vibrations in the ground. Your physiology is vibrating at the dance rate of your tattoos. And you're starting to hear that sort of higher pitch sound that you heard when the lady disappeared. It's starting to emanate from somewhere around here. I think Fida is perturbed, to say the least tries to kind of keep himself steady and uh, I presume it's kind of obvious that I'm shaking a bit gonna tap kind of on the shoulder to try and get her attention easily gotten well I imagine that as soon as he touches her (laughs) she feels the like cellular vibration (laughs) yeah he's gonna lean in and try and shout over the storm I think we're pretty close do you remember the, the glowing woman I mentioned. Yeah, I sure do. Kind of like that. Oh. So where, where do you need me to go? And he gestures in kind of a in a direction where the vibration feels a little bit more, and the sound kind of seems to be. I imagine like it's kind of like as he's turning his head. It's not like um, echolocation or anything, but it is definitely more intense. As he turns and he's just like, just gestures with his forearm and open hand that way. Yeah. All right. Then I will lead the pack with hopefully Fida essentially right behind to tell me when to stop that way. You move that in that direction. You continue to move. And as you do, your feet begin to move across a much smoother stone. And while you move across it, you realize that the rigidity of that stone and the feeling that you get from it in your boots, it doesn't feel like the rest of the stone you just got off of. This feels like camouflaged metal. What Fida does is he taps <laughs> kind of on the shoulder again to stop. And he takes a knee and just takes a screwdriver off his belt and scrawls it along, you know, like holds it in hammer grip and just drags the tip along the along some of that stone just try and see if he if he's right about that feeling sure enough you are right about that feeling that is well camouflaged but there is a a piece of metal here it looks pretty big just looking at some of the ridges in the short distance it has to be 10 12 meters wide yeah that's uh pretty sizable you know I expected the door to be pretty small, but again, when they took a a whole civilization out through here, it would actually make sense to have a a decent-sized door. Gesture towards the ground and just show them what I found. I presume the sandstorm makes talking, like, borderline a waste of time. Luckily for all of you, many of you are are outfitted with comlinks. Some of them are very powerful comlinks. That's true. The captain technically does have one that could reach anywhere on on the average planet. Yeah, you bet. If the captain wants to deploy and use it. Yeah, I'll have it with me and I'll deploy it. Where do we want me to deploy it? Not on top of the metal, but, you know, somewhere off to the side. Well, is it going to work inside if we deploy it outside? Hard to say. It's a huge giant cavern underground, so. All right. I will put it on the rock off to the side. The real rock, not the metal rock. Okay, you set it down. Now, to try and figure out how to open this fucking thing. Fida's looking for, like, one of those 
pull, twist, 45 degree and push back mechanisms. But he's like, no, if you had it outside, you wouldn't put one of those. I'm going to put my filthy paws on it and um, try and say open in my mind. I actually have to probably say it out loud because, I mean, I'm pretty new to this. Okay. I welcome you to roll Empathy Mystic Powers. Let us know what happened. Oh, holy shit. That's uh, that's three successes. Oh, wow. That's a critical success on Mystic Powers. Yeah. I don't know what it does, but hey, neat. You reach out, and with that tattooed forearm, that glowing, even in the dust storm, you sort of carve your way with the, the light that begins to come off your arm. And when you do, there is a response from a portion of the ground nearby as a much smaller airlock opens up on the ground. And you see the sides come up, sort of an automated process happen where a ladder extends out about a meter or so from the ground level. You see light. Oh, enough for somebody to get on easily enough. Yeah, and he's just like, well, there it is. Glowing arms as he points. I'll walk by him on the way to the to the ladder that just magically came out of the ground and see Fida's glowing arms. You know, blue's a good color on you. And I'll just keep on walking. The worst part is when she's right. You approach this hole, Captain. You see that it does appear to be fashioned much like an airlock. Although the technology that's here is a little bit modified. The ladder that extends out into the, well, extends out up from the hole, uh, extends only about a meter or so, enough for you to, to grab onto the rails and then climb down into the space beneath. You do get a good look at the space beneath, and there really isn't much there other than about five to six meters down, there appears to be a, a one-person landing, and then it goes off to the right into darkness. Yeah, I will hop in the on the ladder and start descending. You begin your descent. Anybody else staying topside? Fuck no, I gotta get in there. I figured you were gonna be going last. Yeah. I just need to know if anybody's staying out. No. Sandstorm? Inside. The choice is a difficult one, but I think we can all make it. Icarus is going down into the the hole because what else are you, you going to do? Go into the darkness? Yep, totally fine. You go into the darkness. The ladder takes you down again quite a few meters before you meet a landing. This all looks more like a catwalk once you get on it. There is a very limited amount of light here, but... As you get on that catwalk and take it really the only direction it can go, which is what looks to be spanning part of this larger airlock that you must be near, you get a real good look at the space down here, and it is dramatically open. The catwalk walks you perpendicular to the larger airlock opening space then, and you get a real good look at some of the space beneath. And just the dramatic emptiness which is in front of you. There is a superstructure that has been crafted here. One which does appear to, it looks like, hold back maybe some of the planet's tectonic forces. This is a big gap. And it's also not been made by the planet itself. This is certainly machined at some point. And so a lot of the walls have been smoothed and support structures have been put in and it doesn't look like OSHA has been, you know, called in or anything for inspection probably a little while, but it does look like it has been used. I'll give you some things that you don't see. People. Any sort of screens, signs, directions. None of that. When I hit the landing, I immediately pull out my pistol and survey the area, awaiting the rest of the crew to come down. 
Okay. A quick survey of the area shows that the catwalk does appear to continue to descend over a period of time. You are expecting to see lifts or some type of elevator system. So far, not yet. Mike, I w- once I'm in, I would like, once the last one is in, I would like to close the door. Yeah, easily done. There's a button for it. Oh, hey. Oh, there's a button on the inside. Neat. Yeah, that's actually, I think it being empty is slightly more worrying because I might be part of their plan. Capital T, capital P. And uh, that wouldn't be good. Yeah. You all get down there. So for you, Icarus, this sort of reminds you of some of the places that you were at under or around the monolith and the fact that there's a lot of just catwalks to move around on. And for you, Tamaris, this site really hasn't been... No, it it could certainly be more welcoming. But then again, maybe you'd prefer not. I'm actually okay with there not being a welcoming committee, strangely. Right. That makes sense. Provided the team continues to follow the walking path, you do get into a, as is almost unbelievable, larger cavity that this stuff extends to. So you now can't see the other side of the wall. And in your mind, Fida, this is probably on that sort of geographic or geothermal map where it begins to expand out to make room for whatever they're building down here. Fida feels like, I don't think they were able to use the door that we did. They might, if they're in here, they they probably had to come in through some kind of alternate route, right? Because... They don't have the lights turned on, is basically his thinking. But yeah, he's going to um, point that out to everybody. You know, that this is kind of the area, and it's going to start opening up into that huge void beneath the, the crust, the mantle and all that. Um, nothing to worry about. I am going to turn to the captain and be like, um, Captain, I know it would help us, but it might also give away that we're here real early. Do you want me to try and turn on the lights? Well, I since they already sensed us with their sensors when we came onto the planet. Well, Captain, I was thinking about that, and it depends on how secret it is. I mean, if this was a super, super top secret base, the thing that picked us up mightn't be theirs. It might be the um, the planet security, you know, the, the houses or whatever that have settled here and um, might be there you know, their air control system, or it might be uh, a separate thing which doesn't talk to, you know, the people who are running the super secret underground lab. That's full of technology they don't understand. I barely understand it. And he's looking around and he's like, on paper, I now understand how lots of this works, but uh, like actually intuiting it? No. No, not a chance. You know what? Why don't you give the, uh, the lights a try? All right, Mike, do you want me to roll for lights? Yeah, you bet. Anytime you're attempting to interact with electronic technology by not using, oh, you know, like the normal means, then yeah. All right, one success. Okay. You light up the area near where you're at, so you get a couple of chains of lights on. This, of course, does not in any way, shape, or form seem to put a blanket on the... um, sheer massive state that you were in now you can see the other wall because of this lighting chain that's on and it has to be well well over a hundred meters on the other side and it's bowing out so it's only getting larger yeah and like fight is looking at and that makes him think like when they were designing this place they had to account for the curvature of the planet to uh make sure the floor was flat that's just a neat little thing to think about. It's different to seeing the cross section, right? Where you start, where you're like, oh yeah, look, look at this giant void under the surface of the planet. And then you start to see this is the narrowest part of the giant void. Captain, your radio fuzzes for a minute. Yep. Do I hear anything? Well, you can see on the readout on your communicator, on like the, the larger portion of your communicator, that it looks like something from topside's trying to contact you oh well i'll respond 
This is Captain Amara Castro. You get a very, very broken connection. It's mostly Rakam saying something to the effect of lost signal. Are you, re, are you there? Repeat. Rakam, yep. We're here. You're breaking up a lot, though. Planet side. Arrival. Hurry. Yeah, is that spoken out of a speaker so everybody else can hear? Yeah. I take it to mean that we are... We, we have guests. Yeah, I think that's a safe assumption. I hope Rakam finds somewhere safe to hide. Yeah, uh, should I should I go back? Nope. No time. No, I... Okay, what was our plan again? Figure out what the situation is here, and then, um... Mess with it in some way and delay it. Try and get them to stop. If they won't stop, make them stop. Captain, I think I've made the plan slightly more, uh... Adaptable in a few ways. I'm happy to be used as leverage. Nobody's using anybody as leverage. Anybody bring anything to blow this joint up with if, if if we don't succeed? If we blow this joint, we probably blow up ourselves at the same time, and I'm personally not a big fan of that particular plan. But you also brought me, Captain. After continuing on the walkway, you do eventually, after probably about two to three hundred meters of travel, get to a bank of emplaced elevators. It looks like clearly there is something like a service elevator or um, a larger elevator to your left and then a, a more conventional lift or elevator to your right for people. All right, Vita, this is your show. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you want to take the personal one or the one that could take a small vehicle? The cargo lift. Captain's choice. How about the one that will get us there the fastest? Have we seen any vehicles? You have not. That would be wonderful if we could acquire one. Let's take the personal elevator. He's talking to himself out loud. and He's just like, the thing to remember is that the user controls the speed through the instruction they give to the device. It's important to remember that. He's like thinking, he's like, you have to set the speed mentally rather than you don't have to give it an exact speed, but you can... Part of the knowledge of the portal builders he seems to have is the manual for the, for the goddamn lifts. He has a lot of information from the portal builders that he doesn't even know he has. So yeah, uh, I guess roll to press ground floor. Mm-hmm. Something like that. Feeding me darkness points. It's fantastic. It's almost as if it was planned this way. It's almost as if you devised the whole scenario so that there'd be large periods of one character having to do things that would give you darkness points and the re-rolls. But I don't need any re-rolls because I got two successes. Fantastic. You open the elevator. It whirs to life and there's a clear ding and then the doors open. It does look like it would hold about six or so people. The elevators here are clearly human built. Oh... You have not seen yet any sort of portal builder level technology yet. I thought it was one of the weird disks again. No, this is all human built. Probably didn't need to use my psychic powers for that one, but oh well. He's like, oh, it's got a button. He summoned it with his mind and he's like, wait. Oh, son of a bitch. It wasn't powered on anyway, so you're okay there. You step into the elevator, Fido? Yep. Okay. You enter the lift, and the doors close. You begin to descend. When you descend, you get a better appreciation for the scope of things as the elevator moves fairly swiftly. As you descend, you look out into the darkness of this massive cavern that has been bored out. In doing so, it almost feels like you're back on a planet, and it's dark and the stars are out because the cavern's face is filled with tiny little twinkling lights set against the darkness here. They're far off at this point. Some seem to move. Others stay very stationary. And below, a very faint light begins to come into view. The 
lift crackles with a new sound. You hear the slight hum of a speaker. I don't know who you are or why you're here, but you shouldn't be. I just want you to know it's for the best. Flight is just like, oh no. Is he going to fucking cut the cables on this goddamn lift? That would be undesirable as an outcome. Just like first assumption, what the fuck is this guy going to do? He starts looking around for like a reply button. No, there doesn't seem to be a reply button. Also, it's not an intercom system. It's just a speaker. I mean, maybe there could be a microphone. So the elevator continues to descend and you are awestruck by what you see next. The lift descends until it gets preparing. It prepares to stop, slows down. And as it does, an enormous red superstructure is set against the backdrop here. It's sort of shaped like an acorn. It's red and black. And if you didn't know it any better, it sort of looked like a overloaded seed pod. And it is enormous. The overloaded seed pod is all fight can think about this goddamn thing. Holy shit. They built it on, under the plant. What the f- He's like, that's so much more expensive than- Jeez, <laughs> icons, why? Okay, so, I mean, it mightn't be a risk with the to the portal builders with the darkness. That, that would be great. Um, Maybe they know more than we thought? I mean, maybe, but I doubt they know everything. Holy shit, they built a colony ship underground. The moving lights, which you could see from the lift as it descends, are drones. And there have to be hundreds of them. I think fight is just kind of like trying to take in the scale and like, okay, well, this this changes things. Uh, also makes sense why we didn't see any sign of it in in space. Does it look like, Mike, the plan is that you would send it through and then the different kind of clusters would shoot off almost? Like... Like subships? It looks like that could be a method. It almost seems like there are arches that appear towards the front end, or what you believe is the front end of this ship. And they have to be, oh, I don't know, probably 10 to 15 meters wide a piece. And they ring the outside of the superstructure. And so in your engineering mind, you think, well, if all of those have a secondary payload, a vessel, then, I mean, this thing could have 30 independent ships that could come out of it, all potentially with payloads armed with God knows what, people, equipment. Hopefully just people and equipment, but uh, knowing us when we go somewhere, probably some extra things that turns to the rest of the crew and he's like, I mean, no one, nobody would be insane enough to uh, try and fight the portal builders, right? Like, that would be... Like, they're not that stupid. No, I'm not. Oh, there is a microphone in here. They're all dead anyway. How do you know? Oh, they told me. The one I talked to assumed that his people were still alive. Yeah, he was wrong. At least as far as I've seen. Can we talk? We're talking right now. I just want you to know it's as far as it goes. You're aware of the darkness as a threat to us? I'm aware that the third horizon is corrupted and that the dream that the folks from the first and second horizon had of coming here and finding peace is over and has been. I have been working very diligently at making a pathway out and that is the pathway I am taking. How do you know what's on the other side? I've sent some exploratory vessels, tiny little probes, to sample what's there. I'm confident enough that the ship can make it through. But what if you take the darkness with? You travel through the portal. What if the darkness follows? It can't. I mean, the, the portal's a one-way trip. So what stops the darkness from going with? Because they already traveled here? 
The darkness can't travel through a portal if it doesn't exist. The ship will go through. It'll collapse the portal after it leaves. And then there's no more portal. And likely no more Zamusa. It's too late to stop you, isn't it? The ship's already in motion. What about all the people upside, on topside? Don't have to kill them. I used to think that. I really did. And then I remembered that there's a handful of factions that will just gut me for any technology they could possibly find. They'll use it to their own ends. They'll capitalize on it until more worlds are taken and more people are dead. I'm getting a clean break. So is everybody else that's on this vessel. How many do you have? How many are you taking with you? On board, last count, I have over 1,500. You're going to be very careful with your genetics on the other side. You're going to have to be real careful. Try and prevent inbreeding. How is that what you're thinking about right now? <laughs> Fight is just like, what do you mean? It's a perfectly reasonable thing to think about when you're sending 1,500 people through a spaceport. W- what about we just say, hey... Can you let us take the elevator back up and we'll be on our way? We can't stop them. They're already going. I just think we should leave. She's got a good point. Would you mind overriding the elevator so we can so we can leave? I mean, you don't have anywhere to go when you're up there. Just so you're aware. Our ship's up top. Wait, what do you mean? What did you do to our, our beautiful, beautiful ship? I didn't do anything to it. I don't believe you. I don't care. Oh, great. I don't care what you believe. You brought them here. They traced you to the planet. They're arriving in orbit now. You'll never get off planet. I'll ride the fleet. Yep, forgot about them. I I totally misjudged this guy's motivation, so I'm like, ah, motherfucker. I had this backwards. Well, tell you what. Send us back up anyway. I'd like to see the sun before I die. Try and answer a question or two? Sure. You hear a sort of slight smirk on his voice. The cavern is bathed in a bright blue light. As like the ship begins to fully power up. You can see all of its tiny lights along the curvatures are lighting up. Who built it? Not me. So I'm fairly certain that this is a leftover from the former trip, from second to third. A little bit of the portal technology here helped me modify and complete it over the past few cycles. Mike, is the lift still going down or is it going up? No, it's it, it is it has begun to rise up. Okay, yeah. I was like, am I going to have to try and do some kind of electrical override? Fighter's understanding of the entire situation has been completely ass backwards. He's like, did you have a... How did you recruit these people? They were still in cryo when I found them. I never let them out. That's how you kept it a secret. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty wondrous idea, actually, all of the drone engineering here. It's taken years for them to put it all together. But I gotta say, I think it's pretty well put together. So now that there's light down in this space, a lot of it, and now that you're higher up, slowly going back up, Captain, you see written across the side of this ship in big white block letters, periphery. Well, it's very interesting. I did want to ask our friend on the speaker though, so th- these people in cryo, they were in, you said you found them in cryo. So you found them on the ship in cryo? Yeah. Uh, it's a little gas leak, actually, that led me down here. I got in and got some mountaineering gear, managed to get down here and find the superstructure, found that the batteries were still hot. All of the emergency services were still in place. And so I... Using my position, siphoned some funding away, slowly but surely. It took probably a year to carve out some of the spaces here, but managed. I got power to some of the weird technology the Portugal has left behind. 
and then use the drones to map out what a portal was supposed to look like. And you were working with Marhoon. Hmm? Who? Fighter leans in and he's like, Captain, we had it all backwards. Did you know that uh, someone within the um, within the conglomerate knew about you before we brought him here? She got killed for trying to hide something, but uh, I guess it wasn't us she was trying to hide. It might have been you. I haven't had any contact with anyone in, I don't know, 10 segments, effectively 10 months. So are the people in Cryo, are they people from this horizon or from the second horizon? Mike, as I recall, it wasn't there supposed to be another colony ship other than what became Coriola Station? You bet. This is so what he has, supposedly then is Nadir. And he's renamed it. Oh my god. John, Fida distinctly remembers, distinctly remembers, that when Captain Kasra gave the ship the periphery name, that the technician who input the name, inputted the name into the system, it said there was an issue with it, that there was some sort of blip that happened. It only happens if there's a redundant resignation, like a redundant designation name. All these little things are now starting to click in the back of his brain. He's like, that's why the, you know, lays that one out for the cat, for everybody. And he's just like, Anton, do you want to hear something funny before you go? Yeah, sure. Who doesn't like a good joke? You'll love this one. It'll get a real, real hoot out of you. So we were hired by a rich lady, a very rich lady who gave us a super decked out ship called the per- which we named the Periphery, not knowing the name of yours. And um, he like closes his eyes and smiles. And he's like, she-, she sent us off to get a bunch of portal builder data. I am now the uh, living repository of all or her portal builder knowledge to the best of my abil- to the best of my knowledge, except for whatever is on the other side of where you're going to go. We thought she had been killed for covering for us. I'm starting to have second thoughts about that, but I don't know for sure. You're also going to love this. We thought you were working with the conglomerate and that you were going to do something incredibly stupid, much dumber than what you're actually going to do. And it actually gets a little bit better because now that those ships are here and they're chasing us, for this, even though we were chasing this, thinking they didn't know about it or that it was theirs, which is a whole cluster, other clusterfuck. Our ship's out of cryo. <laughs> we're fucking stuck here and you're going to blow up the planet and we're not going to be able to fucking mine it. This is a fucking who. Oh, man. What a fucking day. The line goes quiet for a little while. The lift continues to go up. But what about the rest of the horizon? You're taking the second horizon to the fourth horizon or wherever it might lead you, but the rest of us are stuck here battling the darkness? I think there's times in life when you have to cut and run. I agree, 100%. You could have offered us a ride. You told me that you wanted to go back up. Oh, they told you we wanted to go back up. Listen, buddy, I I don't know who you are, but... If you have encapsulated portal builder knowledge, maybe we can work out some kind of deal. What do you want to know? I don't know, like your genetic makeup. (laughs) You can't use the tech, can you? I have a lot of failings in life. I have a lot of things I'm successful in, but I don't have any feel for however it is that they move their technology around. It took me two years to calculate all of these different connections. I bet you can do them with a snap of your fingers, can't you? Pretty much. Okay. So it's a fair bargain then. You come back, you load up on the periphery, in exchange, you and the crew live. In the fourth horizon. In wherever we go. We can call it whatever we want. I can't make this decision on my own. Give me a second. I want to go. I figure it's a bad situation, folks. I don't know that we'll be able to... uh to get out of system without being captured by the secret police even if and he's just like even if we do escape this planet before it explodes 
I'm willing to help him. I think what he's doing isn't a terrible idea. It's a chance to kind of start over and avoid what we got now. Are you all okay with going? If it's go or die, I personally prefer going. I like living personally. That's that's just a personal preference. Mm-hmm. I can appreciate that. Icarus's eyes are very wide and she's like, one, I'm I'm not leaving Rakam. We're not doing that. And two, I have family on Kua. I'm not I'm not I'm not going. I mean, yeah, the secret police are up there and I can't, I was never planning on going. So you will most likely be captured. You will most likely be tortured for information and you will most likely rot and die in some far off black hole where they throw you. That is best scenario. Worst scenario is that you go back up top and they shoot you. And Rakam, we can tell him to fly off and or something he could take control of the ship it's not an easy choice kid no it's not a good choice what's the choice you got really n- none of you guys have families none of you I do but I won't see them again regardless if the secret police get a hold of me and If I'm around, then what's to stop them going after my family to use his leverage on me? I'm looking at this very practically, to be perfectly honest. Either way, I don't get to see my family again. Hey, um, Storyteller, on the the periphery underground there, the the big large ship, not our periphery, but that periphery, is it large enough to fit our periphery? Oh, God, yes. And you said there were bay doors on top? I did. Wonderful. About 10 meters wide. Big enough to fit the periphery? Our periphery, not the big periphery. If flown by an exceedingly effective pilot, maybe. Like, like Rakam? Rakam is a pilot, but he's not as skilled as someone like Icarus. Like, in systematic terms, he gets a base number of dice to roll for anything. Systematically, an erratic AI can use any ship systems with a certain number of dice. So he could like do gunnery, he could do sensors, he could do command functions, but like he can only do them so well because he's been programmed by other people. Hey Chris, I know you don't want to leave your family. And I know know you don't want to leave Rakam. What if we could bring him with? The ship, the whole ship. And everything on board. Well, I hope so. She looks incredibly (laughs) uncomfortable. I would hate myself less. No, Rakam's one of the crew. I don't want to leave him behind either, especially not with whatever they might do to him. But I I still think that means I need to go up and find him. Right, and we don't want you to go alone. I'll tell you what we'll do. Alton, we're going to go up, and then I'm going to come back down to you. All right? Okay. And he, like, looks everybody in the eye, and he's just like... I will do whatever you ask. I will operate whatever system you need. I will even set the portal to work however it works. He just says a formula to him, which is basically the underlying formula. It's an inverse log of mass. That's how the, um, that's how the portals work. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's really not intuitive, but I will come down. I'll work with you. We will prepare the ship. All I ask is that you let my crew come back with the last member of our crew and our ship. Sure. I mean, we're we're running out of time, just so you folks know. I, I realize, yeah, we're on a bit of a... But I work fast, and I work well. Well, it takes the periphery a little time to warm up. So I'd say at maximum 10 minutes. Ten minutes? Jesus. We're going to need access to your, uh, to the facility communications network. Would that be doable? Sure. He's like, Icarus, can you give Dr. Bendley the code for raising the sky skimmer? He's going to need to meet us here. 
He's going to need to meet you at the entrance and be ready to roll. Yeah, I, I, um, as good as Rakam is, I think he's going to need some help to slip in. Rakam could do it, but he wouldn't be able to do it fast enough. That's the issue. He doesn't have intuition. He might also ruin that beautiful paint job. I uh, think he'd die first. Yeah, I'll go, I'll go wait for him. Okay. I think you'll all want to be on board. I'll be ready to hook you into the ship into the uh, the peripheries, cryo supply. I'll be ready for all that. I'll work it out with Alton. Okay. The crew goes up. You get the ability to signal out. The bay doors themselves begin to open. Many of you, especially someone like Icarus, is very much used to seeing what happens when a creature dies in the jungle and birds circle it to signify the beginning of a feast. The dust storm is still present but has slowed and there are now 10 to 12 vessels in the atmosphere in the general 3 to 5 kilometer radius and they are search pattering looking for something. You can only assume it is you. You get a communication link back with the ship. You hear Rakam's voice over the communicator say, okay, things are getting a little hectic up here. Are you, are you about done? Rakam, we're on our way back to you. Can you get the ship started? Yeah, yeah. We're going on a journey. We're hoping you would join. What are you talking about? No, wait, don't tell me. I'm just going to finish the first order. I'll get the ship's engines prepared. Fire shouts to them as they're leaving. He's like, the first three sequences, he can just override them. The engines are in good enough condition. Speed is of the essence. You meet him and the ship about halfway. At least most of you. Fida, you head back down. And the lift stops and you get back out on that larger platform area where the lift had stopped before. And you can see that there is a sort of gangplank that runs to a portion of the ship from here. It's very long. It is sort of ostentatious, just in its general makeup. And there is a gentleman at the edge of that bridge. He's wearing a almost midnight blue robe. It's clear he's armed, although it's not in hand, but he does have some sort of Vulcan-like pistol. He has, um, <laughs> I guess, just messy, sort of longer black hair. He wears a thicker beard, although it's not long. And um, he stares across the bridge at you with concern. You're in for a lot of time. Permission to board. Granted. And yeah, Fida starts striding across the, the gangplank. Just like, okay, we'll need to retract that instantly. I can understand some of the stuff here. I grew up working on Coriolis, so a lot of this is probably mirror to that, right? Yeah, it's pretty close. When you enter the periphery, you uh, you see something that is a little strange. And that is, is that the deck plate coloring is very similar to the ship you left previously, as are a lot of the walls here. Same patterns, same lighting structure. I was like looking at all this and he's like, do you retrofit parts from, uh, from present day stuff? As many as I can get my hands on, yeah. We fabricated some of the stuff here. I say we, he sort of gestures around to the cloud of drones that are running around. A lot of the ship is automated because it has to be. There isn't enough crew awake to run the whole thing. I see you got some of it from Chelebs, huh? Yep. Let's take you to the bridge. Okay, let's go. He steps into another lift and you head you head up or over? It's hard to say. Ship designs and gravity get a little bit weird. Yeah, they sure do. He's like, mm, it's really weird to be in a ship like this under gravity. <laughs> yep. You get to the bridge and you see an array of controls. 
several different seats, a much larger bridge than you're used to, including like multiple stations that you're not really sure yet what they do because you can't, the screens aren't lit up yet. And uh, it looks like the ship is going through its initial startup phase. A lot of engine power readouts, a lot of battery readouts. There's an entire readout that just shows what's going on in cryogenics and like the different varied power levels and that sort of thing. Back up top, you can hear the whine of the engines as the other periphery draws much closer. You see the running lights and the maneuvering engines kick in. You get nose to nose with a very um, familiar ship. I'm going to say that we, we scramble on as quickly as possible. Is it just Icarus? Yeah, I'm right behind Icarus. Same. Boarding is a seriously exhilarating experience as the ship is not technically landed. It is hovering, but meters above the ground. And so you have to sort of leap onto the, the ramp and then scurry your way up. It's at this scurrying and finally getting to somewhat firmer ground that the first few blasts go off around you. And overhead, a Technicolor light show begins as you are being bombarded. And that is a natural ending point for this episode. So I look forward to seeing our next episode recorded soon, where we get a wrap on this season of Children of the Privy. So thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your listening ears, and we look forward to next time. Thanks.